What are the country's top CEOs doing to build extraordinary teams and cultures who thrive even during a pandemic? You're about to take a deep dive into the minds of wildly successful C-suite leaders who are evolving the way that we work in the 21st century. Welcome to this special edition of How to Be Mesmerizing. Hey everybody, welcome to How to Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur and oh, we have another mesmerizing CEO with us. Lorraine Sugart is in the house. Lorraine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for our mesmerizing conversation. Oh, me too. I know the last one we had was fantastic. And so I'm so excited that you've made, ta- uh, made time. You know, I know you're super in demand. And so <laughs> <laughs> let's, I'm going to share a little bit about who you are with others so they realize, um, you know, they're going to be just as excited as I am to learn from you today. So Lorraine started her career as a director of public information and special events for the American Cancer Society. And then in the following years, she worked in advertising and PR for big brands like Jeep and Nabisco, Lazy Boy. And uh, while doing that, she earned nine Addy Awards. Very impressive. (laughs) (laughs) And so uh, she also led PR for Joanne Fabrics and uh, worked with national media and put together a pretty amazing campaign that got her on the Today Show and lots of local national uh, news across the country. So Uh, Lorraine certainly knows about PR. In fact, during those uh, times, uh, those campaigns, it says your team broke every media record. What was, what about that? Tell me what that means. Well, what that means is, you know, you're always, you're, it's always, let's see what you did last time, right? And so we would count like how many of our key media and the key media is like, you think of like your, your dream outlet. So for, for entrepreneurs, that would be Forbes probably. Right. And so for us, it was the mainstream TV shows. It was, um, Oprah, of course, uh, Oprah magazine at that point, better homes and gardens, things like that. L decor, we hit all of those. So it was really great. And we did that by just leaning in. So, um, it was great fun and we did well too. So, yeah. yeah. Now tell me, in case other people don't know, what is an Addy Award and how come you won so many of them? (laughs) So an Addy Award, and the funny thing about that is um, we we won them all, I won them all, but you know, it's always a team effort, but I was the writer on those, um, those, uh, they all were in one year. So it was my last year. (laughs) Yeah, it was one year. It was a good note to leave on. I relocated after that, but it was, it was great fun. And um, an Addy Award is an advertising award. So Addy being short for ad. So um, they've expanded, I think, since then. And they're a little bit more encompassing digital media communications and things. But at the time it was, it was advertising and I was a copywriter. And so um, it was great fun. I love to write. And that's what an Addy is. Yeah, that's incredible that you did that all in a single year. So <laughs> you kind of dropped your mic. I'm out yeah. transitioning. <laughs> Bye. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it was fun. It was so, good times. So after all that experience, you find yourself, it's 2012, you're sitting at the kitchen table. We all have our foundation story and, and, uh, and you decide that you're going to create Prosper uh, for Purpose, you know, which is your company. And, uh, and then a few years later in 2016, you became, uh, you got your B Corp certification. And now your clients are exclusively purpose driven brands. So, right. very impressive. So, Lorraine, you started out with a question in 2012 at your kitchen table. And uh, how, do, how can more businesses become a force for good in their communities and in the world? How did you come up with that kind of inspiration? I, when I went to school, it was, if you want to make money, you go to the business world. And if you want to make a difference, you go to the nonprofit world. And as you said, my first job out of school was with the American Cancer Society. And I love the work that I did there. And I just always felt, and when I went to business, we saw the explosion of CSR, which stands for corporate social responsibility, Mm -hmm. but it was so siloed. And so I was always saying, you know, why? Why can't businesses have the heart and mission of a nonprofit and use business as a force for good, do well and do good? Why does it have to be a choice, right? Mm -hmm. And so I started questioning some of those tenants that I'd always been taught. And I wasn't the only one because as it turned out, there are 
thousands of companies around the world that believe that business can be a force for good and are doing that. And so I just really went to, what if we broke down all the silos, right? And what mm -hmm. if we had a purpose that was about the impact that we could make through our business that was a positive impact that was bigger than profit, right? Profit's yeah. great. Yeah. You know, we, we all like profit, mm -hmm. but what else, you know, what could that, what kind of positive impact could profit drive? And that's kind mm -hmm. of how I started that exploration at my kitchen table. Wow. That's brilliant. I love that breaking down barriers instead of an either or conversation, let's have an and conversation. Let's think yeah. with an abundant mindset instead of a scarcity mindset. So I love that. So now you've had lots of experiences. Can you share maybe a couple examples of um, businesses that have become a force for good in their communities? Yeah, we've worked with a couple um, building organizations, companies, one in Vancouver and one locally in Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, like they're building and we know that in building, there's a lot of waste, mm -hmm. but they decided what they wanted to do was create healthier environments, one for homes and one for businesses by reducing the carbon footprint, by using healthier products mm -hmm. in the building materials and even in the paints that were selected and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so you think about that and you think, okay, that is a company that is about driving revenue and increasing profits, but they care about the people who are going to be living and working in the structures they create. Mm -hmm. So that's a great example, I think, of using business as a force for good um, and using it actually as a, a lever also to scale your business. Yeah. How would you use it as a lever to scale your business? So I would say that, and of course, every industry is different, different, but basically using the fact that you're using, that you're choosing to use certain types of materials is a point of differentiation, right? Mm. So let's just use round numbers. If I can build a house for 300,000, that is you know, what I want, but I know that there are a lot of toxic materials in it, or I can build a house that is 20 or 50. And these are not representative numbers. I'm totally making this up just for this sure. conversation, sure. but that is more of an investment, but I look at it as not an expense, not that it's more expensive, but that I'm choosing to make an additional investment um, in this other home that is going to be using curated materials that are non-toxic, that are um, establishing a safer environment for me and my family, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to choose sure. that. So, and sometimes it's not more expensive to use a company that's doing good than it is. I mean, most times it's probably not, but that's just one way that you can think about it. And then for people that don't care, or maybe think that the whole notion just isn't important, you're going to repel those buyers, which is fine because they're not your people anyway, but you're really going to attract the right people who care about the things you do by using your purpose as a point of differentiation. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Yes. Well said. Uh, I would pay more to live in a healthy house instead right. of a toxic house. Yeah. Right. And we would do that for our children. And when you are showing how you're standing out and you're differentiating yourself, then that's how you find your community. You know, right. You're trying to fish the entire ocean. You're trying to find your pond with the, with the fish that you want to catch. Right. And so, yeah, yeah that's, that's excellent. So um, you told me a story that I thought was really good. I was hoping you could share it for everybody else too, about um, some people that were getting out of jail and how an organization decided to, um, uh, to give them an opportunity and connect them with people that sometimes when you first hear it, you're like, Oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. So tell us, about, tell us about that. Yeah. So one of the most inspiring stories I ever told or I ever heard, because it's not my story, um, was an organization that I was with um, that was a social justice or organization. And the founder was had been a minister mm -hmm. and he came from St. Louis to Cleveland, Ohio, to found this organization in the late 60s after 
um, a lot of racial uh, injustice and and you know really turbulent times as we all know the 60s um, were yeah. and so he set about creating responsive programs and he one of it well the first program was working to help people who had served time in jail or prison to re-enter society mm-hmm. and reduce the rate of recidivism so recidivism is, someone who's been, who's committed a crime in the past, committing another crime after they've been quote rehabilitated, right? Yeah. And so recidivism overall in the country is greater than 50%. So if you have already committed a crime, you're much more likely to commit a second. Mm-hmm. So as a way to employ, um, at this point it was just men, they added women later, men coming out of prison one night he woke up in bed and in the in the meantime there was another group that really needed help and these were people that were living in a neighborhood that had very high crime very high crime and they were elderly residents living in public housing so imagine that elderly people in public housing in a city that or in a neighborhood that had a lot of crime and he woke up and he said to his wife I have an idea. What if we have the men that are in the reentry program act as special escort friends and to the elderly residents in the public housing to take them to the bank and doctor's appointments and run their errands? And his wife thought he had completely lost it. Why would you put the people that these the, the elderly residents are probably afraid of in charge yeah. of them? Yes. But in his mind, it made perfect sense. And the reality is that program re- reduced recidivism. I think it was 58% at the time to 12 to 13%. Wow. That's you cannot argue with statistics. <laughs> it was right. amazing. Wow. It was amazing. And so these the people forged relationships, right? The person that was providing that, you know, I'm walking you across this busy street to the bank or taking you your doctor's appointments. And there was a national NBC News interview at the time where they wanted to interview some of the elderly residents. And they said, you know, what do you think about John Smith, you know, being someone that served all these years in prison, taking you to do run all your errands and and being an ex-offender? And they called them ex-cons at that point, which, you know, um, has its own kind of baggage with it being an ex-con. And she said, he's not an ex-con to me. He's my son. And that segment just (laughs) went, you know, viral um, on NBC. And it was just, it's just such a great story about let's not follow the rules. Let's think like what would happen if we stood in opposition to those rules? What would be possible? And it doesn't mean you have to necessarily follow everyone down that path to conclusion, but it's, it's one of my favorite stories about just being disruptive and innovative and, and trying something completely crazy, right? Until it's not. Until it's not. Yeah, everything seems crazy. And every you breakthrough we've ever had seemed crazy until we have it, you know? And so, and then it's like, oh, well, this makes sense. So, um, you know, you talk about disruptive brands and how you like to create them. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about, you know, you already kind of answered the question, but, you know, what is a disruptive brand and what do you do to help form them? So a disruptive brand is a brand that goes about things differently Mm -hmm. and says, okay, what is the, the current philosophy about this thing, whatever that thing is? And then what if that current philosophy was wrong? What if we could create a new conversation that would create a new philosophy that's disruptive, right? It stops people from thinking that they already know. Well, we already know that you don't put ex-offenders together with the most vulnerable population. No one would do that, right? So that's part one is thinking Mm -hmm. differently about the current philosophy And then part two in creating it is bringing the brand, whether it's an individual or an organization, what is unique about them 
that that makes them the right people to do this, right? And so this was a Lutheran minister and a social justice organization that did this. Wouldn't have worked if the American Cancer Society necessarily had tried to do it. This organization had already developed programs to serve both of these populations so that they could establish that they had the knowledge and kind of knew what they were doing, right? Mm -hmm. So as, um, you know, as let's just say a marketer, you've already proven that you know marketing, but you're challenging the current way of thinking about a certain aspect of that. And so whatever field you're in, think about the current wisdom of the day and what's wrong with that. And, and what do you see that isn't working? And then build your disruption around that and talk about why you are uniquely qualified to show and teach or show and do the better way. Does mm. that make sense? It does. I love it. Yeah. Instead of just accepting the status quo, you know, we're right. going to shake it up. Right. See what's possible. I mean, that's where innovation is born. That's right. By challenging. Right. <laughs> yeah. Constantly challenging old ideas. I mean, that's all I do is upgrade beliefs. And then human behavior radically shifts. And then all these other goals that people felt like were impossible to accomplish are just happening naturally. And and I didn't even help them specifically with that goal. I just helped them upgrade a belief and the story they were telling themselves. You, one of your superpowers, Lorraine, is you're a a master storyteller. So you have said that um, you believe that the power to change mindsets is through telling powerful stories. So Mm -hmm. tell me about that story. Yeah, so we know, um, and I've written articles about this as well, we know that from the earliest times of written communication or verbal communication, I'm sorry, um, we have learned as humans through storytelling. That's how we learn best. Think about those annoying story problems in grade school, right? (laughs) There was a reason for those annoying story problems about the trains moving on opposite directions. It's because we learn best through stories. Mm -hmm. Stories touch us emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so from a marketing perspective, bringing the psychology together with the storytelling, knowing that storytelling opens people's hearts, that it ignites that, you know, that curiosity and that engagement with the story. Mm -hmm. And you feel like you're learning yourself versus someone saying, this is, this is how it is. This is, you know, this this is a blue cup. And so Mm -hmm. you're going to accept that it's blue because I told you to, you Mm -hmm. know, I'm going to tell you a story that helps you conclude the same thing. So storytelling, we know works that way. We also know about people that they make decisions and it's whether it's buying decisions or it's voting decisions, whatever it is, not from here. As much as we like to think we're making decisions from our brain, we're not. Mm -hmm. We're making the decisions from our hearts. Mm -hmm. We're emotional beings first, and then we kind of justify it with our mind. Our mind works so quickly to back it up with experiences that we've had or things that we've read that we don't even realize that the original decision came from our heart. So that's what storytelling can really do. And, you know, we do campaigns as well as Um, writing stories like for periodicals or even for people's owned media, which is like your owned media is your, your newsletters, your emails, your blogs and telling stories show is like show don't tell, right? It's show me, don't tell me. And we know that storytelling changes behaviors and that as marketers is really what we're about. We're trying to get people to change their behavior in a certain way. Mm. That's so good. That's so good. And, uh, you know, a million years ago when I was being trained, <laughs> excuse me, when I was being trained to be a, a psychotherapist and I always goof more psycho than therapist, <laughs> but when I was going through that training, um, I remember, uh, there was a, a professor there and he said, if you just see something in a client and tell them that they might argue with you, they might disagree But if you tell stories or you find a way to help them have that discovery about themselves and they think it was their idea, then they'll follow through on it. Love that. So yeah, it's the same. It validates what you just said. So if we think it's our idea or if we co-create an experience, we'll buy into it. Uh, And just like when you're improving your corporate culture, 
you know, if people just hand down the values and say, this is how it is and memorize this mission statement, and we're just going to be this way, and people don't feel like they were a part of it in some way, then the engagement's lower. So, so then, true. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's so true. And I was just going to say, you know, you think about when you ask people for referrals, hey, I need a babysitter. Hey, I need this or that. You know, we may know that there's a babysitting site. We may know that there is a supermarket at the end of our street. We want someone, we don't want to hear it from mm -hmm. the, the, the business. We want to hear it from someone else. Right. right. And so yeah. we want, we want that third party validation in that way. So that, you know, makes so much sense. That's how those uh, five-star ratings, you know, were born. You know, now we just look at how many stars do you have? And now we're rating everybody <laughs> for everything. Yes, you know, you're rating yes. me, I'm rating you. And, and so, uh, yeah, it's very good. So your mission is to use the power of storytelling to help other businesses to solve their social and environmental issues that they might have a passion for helping with. And um, so is there another uh, example you might have of uh, a business that is uh, doing good or that you've helped to become a, a force for good in their community? Yeah, absolutely. We work with a lot. One of the, the best stories, though, is, is um, the Board of Health. So in the state of Ohio, there was a grant given to our local county, but it was for a program for 19 counties. Mm -hmm. And it came from the fact that there was a really um, high rate of breast cancer deaths in certain counties much higher than the national average. And so we looked at those counties to figure out why that was because breast cancer when caught early is highly curable. The death, you know, you don't need to die from breast cancer most of the time unless you missed your early diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we found through research, focus groups, things like that, was that women weren't going to get their mammograms. And there were a variety of reasons for that. So we really, came, we really um, worked hard to say, what kind of campaign can we use, you, can we create using storytelling to help these women? And so we actually um, gathered breast cancer survivors to tell their stories and use that as the basis of the campaign. And the campaign was called My Body Matters. Mm. And um, it was really powerful. We all cried the day that we got together and we're watching the women um, share their stories. And, and we shared those stories out in toolkits that other people were using, other organizations were using. Um, we shared them on social media. There were just all different ways to get the messages out. But we also knew that in some of those places, um, one of the counties was an Amish country. So they're probably not walking around with their phones. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we reach them? And so we did grassroots marketing efforts as well. But it was all based on these core stories from women um, and not, and actually one of them had lost a relative to breast cancer, but the other ones were breast cancer survivors. And so they were telling the story of why their body mattered and, you know, how early detection had really saved them. And some of them did not at all have easy journeys. So, um, again, we could have told them you have a high in death rate in your County. You need to get in there and get a mammogram, but it, it wasn't going to persuade them in the same way as hearing a story from another woman mm -hmm. about their personal journey. And, and I really believe that that's storytelling and the more personal, the better is what really changes behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really agree. What uh, happened with the Amish community? So with the Amish community, we went out to different places they went. So we went to their physician's offices. We went to gathering spaces. We went to libraries and markets and things like that. And we left a lot of material. So we distributed as closely as we could, but there's, there's challenges there. You know, you don't think about Sometimes we just take for granted that everyone has a smartphone. Well, no, not everyone has a smartphone. Not everyone has a computer. And so, um, you know, I started in the field before there was an internet. So it was like, okay, we're but I didn't start before electricity. So, you know, I really had to go back and say, okay, what would this look like? Where could we show up for people? Yeah. 
who are their trusted advisors or their trusted outlets where we could put things. Yeah. And libraries are actually great places to disseminate important information. Mm. Just because it's a hub for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they tend to be community hubs and also churches. So that was the other big one. Yeah. You know, ev pretty much everyone in, um, in the communities that we worked with, they had churches that really served as community focal points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very creative. So, um, you know, you've said that uh, the secret to your success is to come from the heart. You talk a lot about heart, right? And um, caring about people, caring about your customers, being a force for good in the world. Uh, but, you know, in, a, in the marketing world, which is so fast paced, always changing, kind of cutthroat, using a whole bunch of data points where constantly all our data is being collected all the time. Every time I mention something to my wife, I think our Alexa is listening. And then all of a sudden we're getting these ads showing up yes. on our laptops. And so, you know, they're using a lot of data to manipulate people. And you're talking about heart and care and kindness. So does that really create profit in this business world? Ooh, you ask tough questions. Mm -hmm. I believe it does. So I believe, again, that people connect emotionally. And what I will say is data, some, you know, data is great when it informs something that will help you, right? Data for data's sake is neither good nor bad, right? We may not like how it's collected, but the data itself is neither good nor bad. Mm -hmm. But there's two things. There are timeless principles, right? And one of the timeless principles is that people want to do business with people and companies they believe in. Mm. And so having heart, and to me, heart includes integrity and forthrightness and transparency and care and consideration. That is always going to be an asset, right? And I think that with all the technology and all the cold ways that we get information and our information is, is used, when you come from that place that I know you want, to, you want to frequent businesses that are making your community a better place or given the choice between one that is and wasn't that isn't, if you know that, you're gonna choose the one that is. We're seeing that more and more with millennials and then Gen Z. You know, they really care about the brands that they are, they're spending their money on. So yes, I think it still matters. And I think we have to be more intentional. You know, um, I did a post about this the other day, and I've talked a lot about this um, humility and modesty, mm -hmm. and it's, it's good only to a certain point. You know, you have to be able to claim what you are and not let humility, like don't brag, but stand for what you believe in, talk about it, talk about your purpose, because those things matter to the people who are going to work with you. Mm -hmm. And again, if you want to, you want to attract that group of people that are the, the best for you and for whom you are the best, mm -hmm. then sharing that is going to help you kind of emerge from the noise of data points and other impersonal things to really find like-minded souls that you can have those relationships with. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, you made me think of uh, some of the, the fire chiefs um, during COVID. Be, the year, a couple of years before, I've been speaking at a lot of firefighting conferences and mm. Uh, doing a lot of leadership programs for fire chiefs. And then when COVID hit, um, there was a lot of stress, you know, and a lot of worry about, are we going to have enough supplies and what are we going to do? And a lot of fire chiefs rose to the occasion, but some of them were also, you know, got really scared and, and stressed and taxed. And so, um, you know, we were, we were talking about that. And, and one of the complaints that kept coming up was, well, our budget keeps getting cut as well. And one of the, what I noticed from that is that from going and talking to all these fire chiefs is that almost all of them were so humble 
It was like a badge of honor. They were so humble that they would never brag about what they would do. They would never talk about what they would do. And I said, you have to share your story. Like before I would work with fire chiefs, I thought the only thing that you did was you drove your trucks to go put out fires, you know, but they spend like 70% of their time helping elderly people who fell off the toilet and couldn't get back up oh, and had no oh. one to take care of them. They would send a truck over there. And, and I said, why do you have to send a truck? Can't you send a little, a car, <laughs> you know? And he said, no, we, it's just, you know, legality. We have to show up with our truck, but we spend most of the night all night long helping people with tasks like that and being there for people that don't have anybody. I'm like, nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. Nobody yeah. knows that. And if you were telling your story and sharing, instead of trying to be humble and, you know, and that, then, you know, you would have more money in your budget. And so right. I really pushed them hard, <laughs> you know, I love that. Stories. Yeah. I love that. That's so great. Yeah. And, you know, it, it really does help people understand. And so if you convince people and that same person that I told you the story about earlier that woke up in the middle of his, the night and said to his wife, let's do this. Yeah. Um, I had the hardest time getting him to step forward and do interviews and do public speaking. And I said, you know, if you can tell people all the things that the organization is doing and what you've learned yeah. And same thing with the firefighters. What have they learned from that? The people need people who can show up in the middle of the night because they fell off the toilet, literally. Yes. Like, wow, that's so impactful. If somebody I love that lived 300 miles away had a problem in the middle of the night, wouldn't I want to support the people who were there to help them? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. I love questions. And I'm a fan of, of I call them power questions. Because the quality of your questions determine the quality of your life. And that was brilliant. What have you learned from those experiences? Share what you've learned. You're not bragging. You're sharing your That's wisdom right. that you've accumulated, right? And then tell stories about it. You know, right. Sometimes people think marketing is so complicated and scary, and it's not. It's just, what have you learned? Tell some stories about it, right? right? And then you're coming from a place of heart and care, like you said, and that generates revenue. I mean, there's so many B Corps that are doing very well making a lot of profit and they're also taking care of their people and they're taking care of the planet. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I had never heard of a triple bottom line before. I didn't know what that was. And, and we need to make sure that that's, you know, in the common language, it yeah. becomes mainstream. So very good. So there was something else um, we talked about and I jotted down uh, sometimes uh, people will pledge that they're going to try harder or they're going to care more. Or they're going to be a good corporate citizen. And that often that kind of language um, creates a lot of widespread skepticism mm -hmm. because we've heard companies say that before. And for a long period of time, as soon as someone started being a, a representative for a company that just dumped, you know, a hundred million gallons of oil into the ocean again, or poison rivers. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we're going to take care of this. We stopped tuning it out or we started mm -hmm. tuning it out. So what you kind of say is talk is cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's see some statistics. Let's see how you're backing it up. Mm -hmm. And so um, what do you have to add to that? Yeah. So I think what happens is um, those words like improving are non-definitive. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of skepticism is caused from non-definitive. So me, for me, um, if I own that company, less spillage is improvement and 50% less spillage is vast improvement. But mm -hmm. for me, the person who is carpooling to work and fills up the tank once every three weeks, massive improvement is no accidents ever again, right? That's nothing short of that is acceptable. So I think what companies can do and individuals as well is when you're putting that out there, you have to have a plan and you have to say, the, this is our goal. And this is how we're going to get there. These are our, you know, our measurable objectives. And there are companies that have done that. And I'm, I'm going to blank thinking of one right now, but I know there have been several that have done that. But if you can do that, and any organization can do that. I mean, if you've never had a big problem, yay. But it doesn't mean you can say, 
you know, we've always cared about the environment, but over the last few years, we've been concerned by what we've seen. So we're taking steps to reduce our own carbon footprint. We're closing our offices so everyone can vir work virtually. I mean, what a huge thing that is. And we've seen some companies, even Google talk about, you know, doing more remote work and Facebook as well. So two of the probably biggest companies um, and they're taking those strides. Now that may not make you love them overnight, but that's something that is credible that we can hold them accountable to as a public, right? And so that's where I think the rubber has to meet the road. I don't think it's, sure, we all want to improve in many, many ways, but we were doubtful that companies will invest in their own improvement if it affects their bottom line. And what we see with companies that really mean it is they will. They, they, they don't just judge how successful they are. You can tell I'm like getting all excited about this because I believe this so much based on how much profit they have or what their report to their shareholders says. They say, we are responsible to our stakeholders. We are responsible to our employees, our vendors, our, yes, our board, yes, our investors. Um, but most of all, we're responsible to our public and we're responsible to our community and we're responsible to our planet. Mm -hmm. And that is hugely different. It's a, men, it's a philosophy shift, but it's backed up with numbers. And that's why as a marketing agency, when I said, I'm going to focus on working with clients that are, you know, that are in that change-making purpose-driven space, as soon as I found out about certification, I signed up because I said, every marketing company, it's what we do. We take the language of the day and we make it our own. And it just, it adds to the noise if there's nothing to, to back it up. So to me, for, for B Corps, the 4,000 plus B Corps around the world, our, our rubber hitting the road, us walking is our certification. Yeah, that's not easy to get. I mean, there's a lot. I was just going through all the criteria and everything you need to do and all the applications and the fact checks and the interviews and, and all of that stuff. And so it's very impressive. It's not just, you know, you send in your $20 and they send you a certificate. No, 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 <laughs> no it is, it is legit. And uh, it's very impressive uh, for anybody to take the time uh, to get their B Corp certification, because it really shows that you are serious about this. You have, and you, especially Lorraine, it shows your passion, you know, and how much you care about this. And it's so exciting that you are using your voice and your wisdom and your superpowers to be able to help this specific group of business leaders to be able to transform the world. So Thank good job. You. Yeah. So how can people learn more about you and, and all that you do? Yeah. Um, go to prosperforpurpose.com and check out our services there or reach out to me, Lorraine at prosperforpurpose.com and for is F O R. You can also find me on Instagram. I post, um, all kinds of things on Instagram every day um, or reach out to me. Yeah. At any which way we'd love to hear from you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Your wisdom is amazing. And we really appreciate everything that you shared today and, and congratulations on all the success that not only you've had, but the success that you've created for others who are being a force for good in this world. It just, it makes the world a better place. So thanks thank so much for being you. mesmerizing. Thanks for inviting me. It was great. Hey, it's Tim. You ever wonder why so many talented, hardworking entrepreneurs and business owners struggle with inconsistent self-belief or high stress or procrastination or self-sabotage? Well, the answer may surprise you and the solution is already inside of you. I've been searching for the answers to this for decades and I found them and I put it into a new program called The Power of Your Unconscious Mind, Mental Secrets for Accelerating Success. And because you're a listener, I wanna give you a free VIP copy. Head over to PowerMindsetProgram.com. That's PowerMindsetProgram.com and grab your copy today.